Thanks, Sanjay. I'm going to be talking about the next generation of game development um, and try to share some practical tips on where, uh, where we all as uh, programmers or hardware architects or other technical folks uh, should really be spending our efforts to learn new things uh, over the coming years. First, a little bit of background. Uh, we're a game developer in Raleigh, North Carolina on the East Coast. We've been around for a long time and shipped a lot of games over the years. Most recently, we've created the Unreal Tournament and Gears of War games. And uh, we supply the Unreal Engine to uh, over 100 other developers who use it for their own projects. Uh, so the Unreal Engine began really early on in 1996. Uh, it was one of the first really major modern game engines. It had a visual tool set that lets artists go out and build game levels, set up environments and visual effects uh, all in real time along with a renderer, a uh, scripting system, and all these other tools. But uh, Unreal Engine 1 was the last major software renderer. Uh, in other words, this was before the era of graphics accelerators. Uh, it ran code on a 90 megahertz Pentium processor to uh, generate the colors of all of the pixels on the screen um, entirely in software. Uh, this uh, has shaped a lot of my thinking on where we're going in the future, so we'll get back to that later on. So uh, Unreal Engine 2 was the first engine we built that focused on these console machines, PlayStation 2 and Xbox back then. Um, and then we transitioned on to Unreal Engine 3 in this generation. So this is aimed at current high-end consoles, uh, you know, with programmable graphics uh, using the DirectX 9 pipeline. Uh, it's a multi-thread engine, scales up to a whole lot of CPU cores, and has a very advanced and robust feature set. It's being used by a lot of different games of different types, role-playing games, casual games, uh, games that involve sh chainsawing creatures in half, and so on. Uh, let me start out by talking a little bit about what goes into making a game. So uh, when I started out building games in 1991, it was simple. You have one programmer, one artist, you get together for about six months, and a game is finished at the end of that process. Now it's a huge industry. Uh, Gears of War took uh, 15 programmers and 45 artists two years, and it had a budget of $12 million. Uh, it was, it's an extraordinary project. You can't just start a game company right now with a few friends and hope to be successful. It's a very capital-intensive business that has a lot of risks and bottlenecks in it. I'll talk a little bit more about the software side of a game nowadays. So uh, Gears of War 2, our most recent game, is a good example. So the, by far the biggest component of this is the Unreal Engine. It's two million lines of middleware code that we wrote that's evolved over a period of 10 years that provides all of the core functionality, you know, the gameplay simulation, the physics, uh, the rendering, the sound effects. And then written on top of that, there's the code that's specific to Gears of War, the game. Um, and that's a relatively smaller amount of code that, written by a smaller team more quickly. And then all of this is layered on the underlying platform libraries, like the graphics library and sound library. Now let me go through the history of hardware to, to kind of summarize where we are and how, how things have changed over the years. So in the very beginning, CPUs were a single computing core on a chip, a small number of transistors, up to around 1995 when um, instead of focusing on small chips, Intel and others created increasingly bigger chips that try to run one thread of computing work with as much performance as possible. So now they have very advanced uh, processing cores that look ahead to figure out what instructions they can execute before previous work is done, and they're executing work out of order, doing advanced caching and prefetching, and they're putting a huge amount of resources into executing single-threaded code efficiently. Um, and then that's just recently changed now with the Xbox and PlayStation processors. Now they've gone to a large number of simpler processors. The PlayStation 3 has a eight cell computing cores plus uh, one traditional CPU core, and the Xbox 360 has three very simple CPU cores that go back to basically the Pentium style of in-order execution. They've done that because you can execute code with a higher degree of total throughput by running multi-thread code on simpler processors than by running one thread with, an, with a more complex processor. And uh, graphics has evolved a lot over the, this time also. So we started out with the first consumer graphics accelerator about uh, 12 years ago. Since then, we've evolved to a fully programmable pixel pipeline, and now graphics processors are being used for uh, completely different work, uh, you know, video decoding, um, other effects like that. 
And uh, we're starting to head towards a, a whole new graphics architecture, which Intel is starting with their Larrabee hardware, uh, which merges the best of uh, what's in the CPU core with the best of the GPU core. And uh, so what we're seeing over the next few years is our architectures that look like this. Here we have Intel's Larrabee, and here we have NVIDIA's GeForce 8, you know, current generation architecture. In both cases, you have large caches uh, available to CPU co to computing cores um, that can communicate with each other through the caches or go off chip to get to memory controller. But these uh, cores are both capable of executing both general computing and graphics code. Um, Intel's processor is a bit more advanced. It can run any code. You could even boot the Linux operating system on the hardware, uh, whereas NVIDIA's uh, processor is a bit more constrained to only run parallel code and not uh, general operating system code. But this will change over the next few years, and I expect five years from now, you really won't be able to distinguish Intel processors from NVIDIA processors and AMD processors. Um, so we're heading towards a more unified architecture where this is the real graphics hardware that remains in a computer. Um, it's just this little video out um, codec, and everything else is just general computing which can be employed for anything. So with this new hardware model, we really have three dimensions of performance. Um, there's the clock rate. You have three gigahertz or whatever. And these rates aren't going up much because we've started to run into fundamental limits of physics that we start to emit microwave radiation and burn holes and in nearby objects if uh, we run much faster than that. We have the number of cores. And we see now Intel is shipping uh, four core processors where NVIDIA is shipping 32 core graphics processors. And then on each of these cores, we have a vector processing unit with a, which can process a certain number of vectors at a time. And when you multiply the parameters of these dimensions together, then the, that product represents the total aggregate computing power that's available in these processors. Uh, so we're up to about two teraflops of computing power in a high-end GPU right now. When in all of this hardware, you can execute t basically two types of code. First of all, you can execute the traditional computing code, stuff you'd write in C++ today, like an operating system or a game engine. And you can execute vector parallel code, GPU shaders, or anything you can write in CUDA or whatever. So you have these two different execution modes uh, that have some interesting nuances I'll explain later. First of all, uh, let me talk about what I think the big challenges in game development are in the next decade. First of all, how do we program for these crazily complicated architectures? It's hard enough to program for two or three cores. But how do we handle 64 cores and vector instruction sets? And also, where does graphics go from here? Because you know, every new generation of game console is lifted graphics up to look an order of magnitude better than it was in the past. Are there more bumps up ahead, and where are the underlying technologies? And then turn about what, and then we'll talk about what we've learned in the process. So first of all, programming. Um, let's do a survey here. Who, is, who here programs in a programming language? OK, good, Every, almost everybody. So who here is in, uh, pursuing computer architecture or hardware? Who's pursuing software? Who's specializing in graphics? OK, a few people. So this is a good mix. So I'll fix, focus more on the software and the hardware issues. So uh, the key things with software are, first of all, a programmer's time is really valuable. And this is often understated. You, know, you often hear of a programmer who heroically works for a full year to optimize some really little piece of code to run insanely fast on a graphics processor. But that's not what most programmers do every day. We come into the office, we write a gigantic amount of code, almost a ridiculous amount of code. You wonder how we could possibly make all of that work. And we do that continuously for about two years, and then we ship it all. And that's the process of building a game. Um, so we need hardware that's easy to program for. We need programming models that are productive and not error prone. Um, and so anything we do can't be in terms of hardware or programming languages, has to be based on keeping programming easy and not making it more difficult or expensive. And that gets to be a big challenge with these new features, because they are very, add new directions of complexity to it all. Question. Yes? So can you say a couple more words about that? What about today's programming models, especially the ones that you use, are uh, in your view hard, hard to do to make programming productivity? 
OK, programming productivity. Let's say as a baseline, we're writing code in C++, C Sharp, or Java. Uh, what we can write in one day for single-threaded code in a simple programming language like that, it takes us two days to write a comparable piece of code that multi-threads and scales to an arbitrary number of CPU cores, but runs on uh, ordinary processors. So we already take on a factor of two, productivity overhead, if we move to multi-core processors. We can accept that, but it's painful. Then moving to Sony's cell architecture, which is uh, particularly complicated because you, on the cell processor, you can't access main memory directly. You have to arrange DMA transfers from main memory into your little working memory, do some operations on it, and transfer it out. So you have to plan your data flow all in advance. We find the productivity divisor for that is about a factor of five. Writing single-thread code is five times easier than writing multi-thread code that runs on Sony's cell processor. And then writing a similar algorithm that scales to a, like NVIDIA's CUDA language or uh, OpenCL, the vendor neutral standard uh, graphics programming language, uh, has a, a divisor of about 10. Uh, it takes so much effort to restructure an arbitrarily complicated piece of code to run in that model that it's almost intractable on a large scale. Now, of course, if what you're doing is ri you're writing a little 100 line video codec and you turn that into a several thousand line CUDA version of that that runs insanely fast, that might be practical. But what we do at Epic is we write a two million line game engine, two million lines of code. And we can't afford a productivity divisor of more than two uh, without having to go bankrupt in the process of building our games. Um, so let's talk about parallelism and multi-threading in games today. So today we have the Xbox 360, which has three CPU cores. It's a pretty simple architecture. So we've decomposed our engine into two main threads, a gameplay thread, which runs all of our gameplay simulation, artificial intelligence, and all of that complicated object-oriented code. And that con constitutes about 80% of the code in our whole engine. So of that 2 million lines of code, about 1.6 million of it just run in this one thread and don't have to worry about multi-threading at all. So that means we only pay the price elsewhere. Then we have a rendering thread, which submits, a, which traverses your scene data structures, submits commands to the GPU to render the scene, and uh, so on. That's a, another thread. It's a couple hundred thousand lines of code, but it's fairly self-contained and straightforward. And then we have some helper threads to do other things like animation. So Unreal Engine 3 hasn't truly solved the problem of multi-threading. What we've really just done is shoved everything into one big thread and then found two other things to hand off to other threads. This is fine for two cores, but if you give us a processor with 50 CPU cores in it, then we're going to be running only marginally faster than we do on a three-core CPU, since this will be a, these two things will be our bottleneck. Um, and clearly, in the future, we're going to need to use completely different techniques to scale up to support these workloads efficiently. So what sucks about multi-thread programming today? And let me try to describe this cynically. You have a whole bunch of threads running on different cores. Any thread can modify any data anywhere in memory at any time. Um, if you want to synchronize access to a data structure, you have to manually lock stuff you know, lock a semaphore around it so that you s tell other people, don't touch this, I'm using it. And of course, you, you might lock this thing and then somebody else locks something else and then you want, both want each other's locks and now your whole program is stalled in a deadlock and you can't make forward progress. Or you figure it to put the lock statement in the right place and now you're executing code that runs, you know, touches the wrong version of data that some other thread has trampled on. It's extremely error prone and uh, the compiler can't help you with it. Whether your thre code is thread safe or not depends on you reading through your two million lines of code and concluding that it's sound, which is impossible uh, in a particularly complicated engine. So today's multi-threading model is unworkable on a large scale, um, which is to say if you tried to make it scale up to 50 cores and huge programs, then it's commercially infeasible. Yes. So if I told you that we could give you a programming model that was deadlock free and race free and, and uh, gave you some <coughs> even stronger guarantees in many cases, but you would have to pay maybe 50% greater programmer effort up front 
Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, the game industry is heading in a direction that will send most companies into bankruptcy if we continue on this model. So we have to look at solutions that involve moving to a programming model that puts more effort on the programmer in order to make this productive. And we have to look at throwing out, trading off some performance in exchange for more automatic parallel models of programming. Uh, yes? Um, Tim, would you mind repeating the question because I'm not sure remote. <laughs> right. The question is, in our two million lines of code, have we, how much have we dealt with this and has it been a real problem? Well, the answer is we really sidestep the question because all of the code that deals with these messy, complicated, interrelated data structures that would need synchronization, we've thrown into one thread. So it doesn't have to synchronize at all. And then we found a few other systems that are mostly self-contained and we moved them off into separate threads. So we have avoided the problem. If we tried to take the problem on directly by, well, I'll describe the real core of it uh, in a moment. If we tried to take that on, I can't imagine how it would possibly work reliably. Um, and I don't think that most other developers who try to use a technology like ours would be able to deal with it either. Let me uh, go on and describe the real central difficulty in this. So our gameplay simulation deals with the code that moves around all of the objects you see on screen, there you have data representations of these visual elements. There are typically thousands of gameplay objects. Each one has modifiable state. You know, the player can, has his health that changes every time you're shot. You have your location in the world. Everything's moving around and interacting dynamically. Uh, so when you're updating one object, it might bump into another object and send it a message that modifies itself. So each time you update one gameplay object, it might go off and modify other gameplay objects in the process of that. So you have a whole lot of complex data which is updated depending on other data and all of this code is object oriented. So you're calling a virtual function in some class and you don't know exactly what code it's going to run at runtime because it could be one of several hundred possible instances. Uh, so this, this isn't something you could statically plan a multi-threading scheme for um, in any practical way. The code is too dynamic for that. And it's written by a whole lot of programmers. And it's worse for our, the companies who use our engine because it's, they start with a bunch of code written by us and then their team extends it. Uh, so you have a very complicated problem that no one programmer really knows what's happening in the entire code base at any time. Every programmer is just familiar with their one little piece of it. Um, and they're not always the world's best programmers because you know, gameplay guys work for peanuts. Kidding about that. Um, so, <laughs> right. so, in the future, all of our games need to scale to lots of cores. We're talking about maybe 20 cores, maybe 100 cores. We need to be able to avoid single thread bottlenecks because our current strategy just won't scale up to the whole large number of cores. So, there are some future forward-looking solutions. We've talked about shared state concurrency, putting locks everywhere and letting any thread do whatever it wants, and that seems intractable. So the other proposed solutions that have been widely researched are, first of all, well, that manual synchronization approach, which sucks. Then there's this other model called message passing concurrency. The idea is you think of every gameplay object as running on its own little thread, isolated from all of the other gameplay objects. Um, uh, so, first of all, a gameplay object can't modify anybody else. It can only modify itself. And if it wants to interact with anybody else, then you send it a message. You tell the player sends a message to his weapon say, saying, fire. The message spawns a projectile and it goes flying off. Um, that model is infinitely scalable to lots of threads because each object is isolated. The problem is a lot of these interactions between objects are complicated. So the player doesn't just fire his weapon that way. He first of all asks his weapon, hey, weapon, do you have ammunition? The weapon says, yes, I have one bullet left. So then the player says, OK, fire that bullet right now. And then the gun goes off and carries out its logic. Um, the problem is, if you did that with message passing, you might ask, if it, ask it if it has a bullet. It might tell you it does. And then by the time it receives the fire message from you, it's actually done something else with that. So you can easily run into situations where interactions become out of sync because of these asynchronous messages flying around and arriving in un unpredictable orders. Um, 
So you end up implementing complicated synchronization protocols manually, and they tend to be error-prone. The, uh, the really more interesting solution is to apply the database solution to this problem. Databases over the past two decades uh, developed this notion of transactions. Basically, an isolated operation that goes out and modifies some memory uh, isolated from all other operations that might be occurring. So that it always occurs with an atomic, consistent view of memory. Um, though, when you have a bunch of transactions, like say, updating each of your thousand objects is uh, bundled up into its own little transaction. So there you have a thousand transactions. You run the logic for each one, and then in software, the language runtime underneath your compiler analyzes what data was touched by each object update and then determines which objects updates didn't conflict with each other. So for example, if I'm interacting with my weapon, then you can't update my weapon and I simultaneously. But me and this other player over here and that monster who's going to attack us can each be updated independently. So you run the update code for them uh, in an isolated version of your memory address space. Uh, you then compare the changes that each of the updates made, and if they didn't conflict, you apply them all. So in the case where you have a whole bunch of operations occurring simultaneously that don't conflict with each other, basically one, no one of them reads or writes from memory that another one writes to, um, then you can update them all in parallel and apply those changes to global memory. And if you do have a conflict, then you apply one of them and then make the other uh, rerun itself from scratch. So this only works for certain kinds of code. For example, you can't go off and like send a network packet in the middle of one of these operations because you can't undo that operation. In order to run a transaction, you need to be able to isolate all of the changes you make to memory so that you can undo them and rerun them. Well, if you can do that, then in any code that modifies global data, you automatically get a consistent multi-threadable view of, of gameplay objects or any other system like this. So this has been deployed. And you know, when you go out and charge your credit card, uh, it goes back to a back-end database at Visa, which uses transactions to sort out all the transactions of everybody making charges on their credit card. And as long as no pe two people are charging the same credit card simultaneously, they're all in parallel. So this is practical, but it requires a whole lot of runtime overhead. So a problem which used to be handled manually by programmers and is now done automatically by the language and the programming model, but with some overhead. Um, this can be done with between 30% and 2x performance. And uh, so it's not a worthwhile trade-off if you're trying to use this technology to scale up to support two processor cores. But if you have 100 processor cores and productivity is your limiting factor, then this is very attractive. It means you can take advantage of 50 of those cores without any effort at all. Yes? Have you guys experimented at all with this code on NCAP? Uh, yeah, so I took a, so I generated a bunch of profile data. So basically looking at some updates, uh, going through a level and seeing what happens with actor updates uh, with all of the actors in an Unreal Tournament level. Um, it turns out about 90% of the updates are independent of other updates and can be run in parallel. And about 10% need to be, are dependent on other ones and need to be sequentialized. So it looks like about 90% concurrency is feasible in that kind of game's case. But as you scale up to larger numbers of objects, then you're still going to have the same basic percentage like forms of gameplay. But definitely all the data we've, I've seen in games indicates that this is definitely viable as a way of scaling up to lots, lots of threads in the future. And so, uh, both Microsoft and Intel have research projects to add software transactional memory support to the C++ compiler. Um, it does all the work for you behind the scenes. It slows down performance somewhat, but it makes it much easier to scale to lots of threads. So it's a good solution for a lot of problems. So have you downloaded the compiler from the GIM code? Um, no, I haven't tried their compilers. I implemented my own little scheme for this. As a so you can either do this and make it automatic Whenever you write C++ code, it automatically goes through this. Or you can write a wrapper library where you wrap all memory read and write operations around your own transaction framework. That's what I did to get my data. And that, those results look promising. Okay. Yes? Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was going to ask you what about geofunctional programming. <laughs>
Pure functional programming is the other interesting solution here. The idea is if you write code without any side effects at all, um, then parallelism is automatic. Um, so first of all, you ask, how is it possible to write code without side effects? Well, the idea is you write functions that are mathematical in style. A function takes some parameters. It computes a result based entirely on those parameters and returns them. It doesn't like read any stuff from disk. It doesn't write to memory or read from memory. It just looks at its parameters, computes something, and returns it. Um, with that programming model, whenever you're executing a function, any sub-expressions you encounter in that function can be run in parallel or in any order um, without affecting the results of the computation. Um, if you think about it, it's kind of a mind-boggling level of parallelism that's present there. Um, so why don't we all write code in the pure, func pure functional style? Because it's a pain in the butt for most things. Um, for example, gameplay updates. They're all about objects moving around in the world. So how do you do that without modifying anything with side effects? Well, there are actually ways to do it, but they're very convoluted. So this only is practical for algorithms that are mathematical in nature. If you wanted to compute the bounding box of a large set of objects, then that's a perfect problem for pure functional programming. Whenever you can describe your, your problem as a mathematical process that doesn't depend on state. Um, I, I'd say about 40% of the high performance code in Unreal Engine 3 could be accelerated with pure functional programming. The rest requires um, software transactional memory or a similar technology to accelerate it. Um, so in a function like this, let's see, the compiler can automatically extract <coughs> multi-thread code. And there are a bunch of research pro projects like Parallel Haskell, a little functional language compiler that automatically runs on multi-core CPUs. Um, it doesn't yield enough speed up yet on you know, four core CPUs to really warrant its use. But as you get more and more cores, this technology will make more and more sense. So I could see in the future us working in programming languages that are more constrained. So you can either write completely general code that's not multi-threadable. There you can do any I.O. or disk access or network messaging or whatever. And then within that, you have a subset of code that uses software and transactional memory. That code can read and write from the heap, but it can't do anything that's irreversible. So that's automatically uh, thread parallel. And then there's a subset of that which is purely functional, which is even more parallel. Um, so if you're able to write code that is sufficiently constrained and the compiler can verify those constraints, then the compiler could automatically multi-thread the code for you. And I think this will be used increasingly in the future as programming for these devices becomes harder and harder. And finally, there's one more dimension to concurrency that's really equally mind-boggling, and that is vectorization. This is the trick that uh, GPUs use to get teraflops class performance. Um, and the GPU vendors tend not to describe this at all in order to make it seem like magic that their hardware does, but it's actually quite straightforward. Um, so. If you've used Intel's SSE instruction set or uh, Apple's AutoVec instruction set, you've uh, seen a vector instruction set. Basically, you have vector instructions that can operate on multiple data components at a time. Uh, for example, a vector add. You have a vector register. This is one register that contains four components, like four 32-bit floating point values. Here's another register. You call this one vector add instruction. And it adds these guys component-wise to generate new vector components. So those are old vector instructions, and they weren't particularly useful because those instruction sets lacked a few features um, that GPUs have that turn out to be the key to vector magic. Um, so first of all, GPUs have wider vector instruction sets. CPU vectors are four wide, and GPU vectors are 16 or 32 wide. All their arithmetic operations to 16 32-bit floating point operations in parallel, which is a huge amount of work if you think about it. Um, and they also support vector loads and stores, which means if you have one vector register that contains 16 offsets into memory, you can do a load operation. And there's this crazy memory access hardware in these machines that can go off and look at 16 memory locations in parallel based on the offsets in this one vector, gather them all together into a new vector. So you can do basically a load with, from an arbitrary indirect address which is different for each vector component, um, and gather them into a vector and do the same thing for writes. 
and deal away with dealing with conditionals. So the neat realization is that with the GPU class vector instruction sets, any code that meets certain constraints can be vectorized. Um, and I'll go through an example of what that means. It's actually much more general than um, you might think it is from playing around with CUDA. So for example, here's scalar code, ordinary C code that generates the Mandelbrot set um, by iterating through a set of numbers, computing a complex number, iterating through this while loop until some condition is true, and then outputting a color. So this is like a pixel shader almost. It does some work, computes a color, stores it, moves on. Um, with that vector instruction set, we can actually transform this from scalar code that computes one color at a time to vector code that does 16 iterations of this loop in parallel and outputs 16 colors at a time through a straightforward mechanical translation. So instead of stepping through the loop one element at a time, now we step through it in, where big N is, a, say, 16 elements at a time. We compute the vector version of i, which starts out, you know, if i is 100, then you have 100, 101, and so on, so that each iteration of the loop can access that index variable with its unique local version of it. And since you might have an arbitrary number of elements which isn't uh, directly a multiple of your vector width, you have a mask which says which elements of the loop are actually <laughs> effective and being operated on. So here I've gone through the process of translating this simple C code into vector code, which now does 16 iterations of the loop at a time. The magic of it is each w instruction here that does one operation translates to also one instruction here, which operates on 16 values at a time. So this code runs literally 16 times faster than that code without any multi-threading at all. It's just using the vector instructions for acceleration. And uh, this is all a mechanical process a compiler can do. When you write a pixel shader in OpenGL or a CUDA program, then the CUDA compiler automatically translates your ordinary scalar-looking program into a vector program that does the same thing with slightly more convoluted logic to make it 16 times faster. So this can be applied in a lot of different ways. First of all, when you have a loop that goes through a bunch of elements, you can vectorize the loop. Um, where have you, where, when you have a conditional, you can vectorize the conditional by X, running one branch, running the other branch, and then merging the two together based on the vectorize that. It is automatic and mechanical. So what I've described here is basically a computing model where you have four computational worlds, each one a subset of the previous one. The most general one is sequential execution. And whenever you write C++ code today, it's running in this environment. It's single-threaded by default. It's non-vector. It's ordinary. You can do absolutely anything in it with no constraints. Further constrained, you have software transactional memory. More constrained than that, you have the purely functional language subset. And then you have the subset of language, which is vector parallel. These are pieces of code that can be run using these wide vector instruction sets with an automatic translation. Um, and e here's where the performance magic comes in, right? Uh, say you have a bunch of cores. What's the number? 64 cores, which looks commercially feasible for the, in the next few years. So ordinary C++ code runs at ordinary performance. Anything that's automatically threadable can run at up to 64 times higher performance on your 64 cores. And anything that can also be vectorized is now 1,000 times faster. And uh, these ratios really play out. If you look at the ratio of performance of an NVIDIA GPU to a single Intel CPU core, it's like this within a factor of 10. The difference being that Intel's cores are designed for faster single thread execution. So the difference in performance is really more like 10 to 1, or sorry, 100 to 1 instead of 1,000 to 1. But there are enormous gains to be had there. And the limiting factor on these chips is really their power consumption, right? You know, nobody builds a chip that consumes more than like 150 watts of power. And Intel's CPUs consume the same amount of power using this amount of performance as NVIDIA's do using this amount of performance. So your system really is more efficient when you're writing code that can be fully parallelized through vectors and cores. Uh, 
Before moving on to graphics, we still have some time. Anybody want to ask any questions about these programming model issues? Let's uh, start. So okay. there are uh, multiple different programming models associated with each of these uh, architecture styles. Uh, and there are, of course, uh, consensus that people try to, uh, you know, say this one is better, that one is better. From a game engine point of view, which one do you think will become the dominant factor in this? Okay, so from a game engine point of view, I see the two solutions I've outlined as the two approaches that are generally applicable to large programs like ours. So you have a two million line of code base with two million lines of code. I can see exactly how we can produce and ship a game that divides some of that code into transactional memory, some of that code into pure functional, and a very small portion of it is left over, you know, generally uh, effectful. Uh, I can see that working completely, whereas it's uh, definitely not tractable to like rewrite the Unreal Engine 3 in CUDA because you don't have support for function pointers, virtual functions, or any form of really dynamic control flow. Um, so every other parallel solution I've looked at seems like it may be useful for a very for a constrained form of problem. Like CUDA is a perfect currently the best solution for optimizing a compute kernel to run on a GPU. But over time, I really think that those are the most, most promising general programming models that will work for almost any class of program. So a combination of software transactional memory and CUDA. Right. Because between them, you can write code that's similar in productivity and performance, similar in productivity and style to C code today. And that's really important. You don't want programmers to have to learn a wild new programming model. In terms of uh, where the Unreal Engine today spends its time, could you sort of categorize it on the dimensions it provides? Oh, OK. Let's, uh, yeah, let's do that. So the funny thing is we have a separate CPU and GPU. So we consume uh, maybe half a teraflop. GPU shaders of different forms. So this is entirely running on the GPU, not at all on the CPU, and that's uh, about half a teraflop of performance. The rest is about 50 gigaflops of performance, basically as much as performance as the multi-core CPUs provide. Um, of course, everything is running in the sequential execution mode with its manual multi-threading, but all of our gameplay code, 100% of it, which is uh, about a quarter million lines of code in Gears of War 2, uh, could be written within the software transactional memory framework. You know, it's gameplay code, so it's reading and writing state, but it's not going off and sending packets across the network. All of that code happens elsewhere, so that's 100% translatable to the transactional memory framework. Then what's left are um, tools, user interface stuff, anything like that is sequential. But it's not performance critical, so you don't care. And now you're left with the systems that are largely numerical computation, like a collision detection, physics simulation, particle updates, and things like that. Um, those are about half and half. Some of those things can be phrased very simply as a purely, in a purely functional language. Like collision detection takes as input a huge data set that's not moving plus a direction vector, and it computes where you collide with that and returns a hit point and a normal vector from it. So it's a pure function um, and can easily be written there. But a physics solver is a more complicated thing, though it's theoretically it's just a mathematical function. It's always going to be deterministic and doesn't need to modify global state. Uh, most of the implementations of physics solvers use matrix solvers. They're highly iterative and involve you know, modifying matrices over time. So some of that would fall here, some of that would fall here, but uh, a large portion of that code is vectorizable, though much less than the GPU. So most of the inner loops of a physics solver, for example, are actually vector parallel, though uh, we don't derive benefit from that today with Unreal Engine 3 on current hardware. In future hardware, like NVIDIA or Larrabee chips, a lot of that will be vectorizable as well. So I would expect the majority of our teraflops to be consumed by uh, vector, vectorizable code, even when you ignore all of the graphics code in our engine. Uh, 
Um, so, the, yeah, the question is, do you have an enough memory bandwidth to support running a thousand times faster? Uh, and the answer is uh, no. You, uh, so memory bandwidth is going up at a rate that says that we'll probably be able to scale up to as many cores as we're given in these worlds up to 64x uh, without running into memory bandwidth limitations. Uh, just because as caches, most of our, like 99.5% of our memory reads fall into one of the caches on the CPU's cache hierarchy in our general engine code. Um, so almost all memory reads are cached and only a minority of them go off into main memory. So we have very little main memory impact from that code and if you double the number of cores and also double the size of the caches then your memory bandwidth isn't necessarily going up by dramatic amounts since uh, doubling the size of the caches means that now data is more than you actually have an improved likelihood that any read is going to fall into one of the caches that one of the cores has, as long as they're somewhat coherent in what they're executing. But there's no way that any conceivable commercial memory subsystem could provide a thousand times more memory bandwidth than we use now. Um, GPUs get away with that level of performance only because DirectX or graphics and rasterization in general are the most embarrassingly parallel and memory coherent applications ever developed and because they rely highly on compression um, in a fundamental way. You know, DXT texture compression compresses textures down to four bits that would otherwise be uh, 32 bits or more if it's banded. Uh, so to get up to these levels of performance, you're really limiting yourself to a small class of highly coherent algorithms and other cases where you can manually implement your own decompression or other techniques to use memory bandwidth much more efficiently than is normally the case. So a lot of the time you'll just be, won't be able to make it into that realm because of memory constraints. But that's okay. I, if we can only be 200 times faster than we are now, then I'm happy. Uh, Do you see a processor with a multiple issue becoming a mainstream of a research area again because as an alternative to a vector? Oh, uh, so I think the the performance analysis says that uh, vector processors are far more efficient than out of order processors or lots of single cores for anything that's mostly vectorizable. Um, just because a vector unit is very simple, it's just a bunch of multipliers and adders um, that a single execution core can feed very efficiently. Um, Whereas the control flow logic that in a modern out of work order uh, processor is vastly bigger than the vector unit. So uh, it's almost like if you have a big out of order CPU core, adding a vector unit into it is almost free and it makes your vector code 16 times faster uh, since the, the ratio is so, out of, so extraordinary. Uh, so it's a good question in the long run. Ultimately, it comes down to what portion of future code is going to be vectorizable, but I think this is really the end game of computing. Uh, it's a lot of cores, each core having a vector instruction set, and most of your code scales up to cores and vectors properly. Some of it scales up to only lots of cores, and a very, very small fraction of it is single-threaded. Oh, so um, vectorization is the source of the big speed up here. Transaction is just an, transactional memory is just an enabling technique to enable you to write this parallel code efficiently. So if you wrote manually synchronized code in C++, which is always feasible but extremely difficult, uh, then you would also be in the 64x margin here. It would just be at a high productivity cost. So. I'm not advocating transactional memory or functional programming because they enable new, new layer levels of performance, but just that they enable us to get full multi-thread performance without as much pain and cost as the old approach. Sorry? 
Oh, right. So there are two parts of the question. First of all, what do we do to, to help our programmers write multi-thread code efficiently without trampling on each other's data structures? Uh, the answer is we actually do fairly little of that. Um, only a, min a small minority of our programmers actually deal with the multi-threaded code. And as I described earlier, we've shoved 80% of the source code in the engine into this one main thread. And that means that everybody who writes gameplay code, which is typically more than half of a game team, um, is limited to that one thread and doesn't have to worry about any thread synchronization at all. Um, and then the, at the, of the rest of the engine code, only a few systems are multi-threaded. The render is multi-threaded, so the several people on the team who write rendering code have to deal with that. And they deal with that by writing code carefully, by understanding the synchronization requirements. And we have some documents you know, describing how it all works internally. So it is an area where we just program carefully and rely on highly skilled engineers uh, to get through that. But those techniques definitely don't carry it over into these very large scale concurrency solutions. Um, in order to move an engine to a software transactional memory model or a pure functional programming model, um, it, most of the engine will be need to be rewritten from scratch. Um, and most of the ways that we do things will need to be, will need some level of rethinking. You know, for example, a lot of the data structures that work really well um, in a single thread environment, like an octree, for example, need to be revisited when you look at them uh, in a transactional memory model. With transactional memory, if you have a whole lot of threads that do mostly independent things, but they all increment one global counter, then they're all serialized because they're all competing for access to this one cell. Uh, so now you've destroyed all of the parallelism in your whole program by accessing one variable accidentally. So instead, you need to restructure these routines, or like an octree. You need to restructure the octree so that whenever an object moves, it doesn't modify the parent node of the octree. It traverses down the octree and only modifies the several nodes at the bottom that are necessary so that most objects don't compete with each other or conflict with each other when they move. So a whole lot of an application where we need to be thinking along these new lines. Fortunately, the, the ideas and notions and programming techniques we use today still carry over with just some new insight required. It's not like learning in a completely new programming paradigm. Uh, I think code in this style will still look very much like today's C++, Java, C Sharp code um, and not require <laughs> entirely new brain rewiring. Well, let me make a suggestion that we take questions for the question and answer session in about 10 or 15 minutes. Okay. okay. Um, so I'll move on and talk a little bit about graphics. I'll just touch on a few topics here at random. Um, today, we're stuck with this funny programming model, which is sort of programmable. What it really is, is it's a fixed function pipeline uh, where you have a rasterizer and all these other components with a few places where you can plug in a programmable shader. You can plug in a vertex shader or a pixel shader. Um, it can run some constrained but mostly general code at those stages. But what you can't do is you can't rewire the pipeline or you can't replace it with something entirely different like a ray tracer um, and still use the GPU efficiently. Even within what they call programmable shaders, you don't have a real programming model. For example, you don't have support for random access memory rights. You can't create data structures. Like you want to create a little tree structure per pixel. You can't do that. Um, you can only do a few things, such as writing out the current pixel into the frame buffer. Uh, but you're very limited there. Uh, so many of the techniques that were pioneered in non-real-time graphics in the 1980s uh, can't be translated directly or naturally into a GPU shader, but require some sort of often hideous translation into intermediate multi-pass uh, shader, shader techniques, uh, if they're translatable at all. And it's also a weird model, since you have the CPU here and the GPU here, and they're communicating through this big, complicated API. It takes a lot of work to get data from the CPU to the GPU. You have to create buffers using operating system calls and update it, them using certain semantics. So it's rough. But the, the secondary result of today's rasterization pipeline is all games look similar. They have similar artifacts, uh, similar strengths. For example, every game that's shipping for every console platform has serious uh, 
aliasing flaws, both with edge aliasing, um, where you see edges of objects flickering, especially when they're uh, near, uh, near vertical gradient. Um, and you see enormous flickering whenever you have a, a nonlinear computation done in a pixel shader. Uh, so for example, specular lighting, uh, which is done with the you know, blend fong lighting model uh, from a pixel's normal vector, uh, is a nonlinear non computa computation. So the filtering that you get out of texture filtering doesn't translate into a fil proper filtering of the pixels on the screen. You get flickering and other crazy artifacts. Um, and these aren't really solvable in the current rasterization model. So we have this idea called multi-sample anti-aliasing, where you can improve your reduced aliasing by a factor of four by quadrupling the size of your frame buffer. Um, but aliasing is still such a problem that to improve aliasing really substantially, we'd need to use you know, many gigabytes of frame buffer memory, and it would be impractical. Uh, so my hope for the future is that we can bypass the graphics APIs completely, right? Uh, software code you know, that implements a graphics pipeline from top to bottom, and whether it runs on a CPU-like device or a GPU-like device is you know, a neutral question. It can run on either, but the key is the programmer should have control of the entire pipeline from top to bottom and not have any constraints at all. And at that point, it's not really even a graphics pipeline. It's just a bunch of code you've written that can do whatever it wants. Um, so we did this back in 1998 in Unreal 1 software render. It ran quite well on a 90 megahertz Pentium. So it's clear that we have enough performance to run a reasonable graphics pipeline on hardware today. And as, a, as NVIDIA's hardware becomes more general and Intel ships its Larrabee hardware out uh, and you know, releases a teraflop of completely general computing power into the market, suddenly this will be very attractive. It will enable you to get to the pool full performance levels we have on GPUs today, but with, without any of the fixed function limitations. So we did this in the past and it looked good, uh, but there's some interesting math here. So these old Pentium processors we ran at you know, 320 by 200 resolution, really low resolution, um, translates to enabling up to 16,000 operations per pixel being performed at a HGTV resolutions uh, today. You can do an enormous amount of work uh, per pixel if you can vectorize your code and properly multi-thread and run it on one of these general purpose processors. Uh, which says there's a whole lot of potential here because you can start to think of going back to the 1980s, looking at all of the legacy research papers on rendering topics that were completely non-real time then and now run them in real time. You know, things like A buffering or the Ray's rendering scheme, uh, which you can't even contemplate implementing on top of a rasterizing hardware architecture. So uh, here's some thoughts on what you could do with that power. First of all, you could do ray tracing, and there's a lot of research here along those lines. Um, so I won't say a whole lot more about it. But this gives you a whole bunch of effects that you just can't get within rendering. Like you can get very accurate reflections off of smooth surfaces. Um, you can get some sorts of lighting effects that otherwise require huge amounts of computation. Um, so I think that there are a lot of interesting prospects here. Uh, they can also be integrated with other rendering techniques. And then there's the RAISE rendering model, which is a shorthand for render everything your eye sees or similar. Um, the idea is you take all of the objects in your scene and you need slice them down into subpixel triangles. So you're basically recursively subdividing everything using a, a crazy level of detail solution so that you get into subpixel triangles. and then instead of doing texture mapping on those triangles, you actually store colors you know, for your model. If you have a monster, you store a two million polygon monster model and in each triangle in the monster contains a color. There's no texture map on the guy at all. And then when you go down to render these subpixel triangles, the triangles with their colors uh, perform the same role as texels do today. That is, they're the carriers of color and other rendering parameters on the surface of an object. Um, with this approach, you can bypass the texture sampling hardware in the GPU um, and implement direct rendering of more complex objects. So, you know, I go way back in game development. Back in the early days, we'd render mostly flat shaded objects in a scene and then occasionally render a texture mapped one because texture mapping was really expensive. But, you know, that seems funny, right? But 
I think when we look at it now, we'll laugh at the fact that we ran, rendered huge flat polygons on the screen because uh, geometry was so, so expensive today. Instead, we'll just render meshes with enormous quantities of triangles on them and let the, you know, the low-level renderer sort them out. With this approach, you can get much better anti-aliasing. Now, instead of doing multi-sampling and taking a bunch of discrete samples and averaging them together, you can actually compute the precise area of each triangle affecting the box corresponding to each pixel and compute an anti-aliased uh, pixels directly. Um, so there are a lot of interesting prospects there. Uh, a lot of movie rendering today is done with rays rendering using very, very high polygon objects. Um, so the funny thing is today in Gears of War, we build a character model. First of all, we start with a very high polygon model, like 4 million polygons, for example. We model all of the bumps in the thing's face, character or monster, in great detail. And then we, render, then we build an in-game uh, low-resolution mesh for the character, which is more like 20,000 polygons. Uh, we render those polygons, but we have a process where you take all the geometry detail and the full, char full resolution character and chop it down into normal maps. So we can get the lighting interaction of the full high polygon mesh on the low polygon mesh without all the geometry. Um, so we do that today, but in the future, hopefully, we can just go and render the full high resolution mesh um, and get better results. And the differences will show up on the silhouette edges of the character, where you'll see curvy or bumpy edges rather than big, flat polygon edges. There's also the possibility of implementing volumetric rendering schemes. Um, this is the technique that's used for rendering clouds in movies or generating uh, pictures that represent MRI, you know, me medical imaging. Um, there are a lot of schemes for that. First of all, you can have a, a three-dimensional field of voxels the 3D equivalent of pixels, and render them directly by traversing through the voxels, generating them. So the code like that tends to be perfectly multi-threadable and vectorizable, so it's very suited to a GPU-like architecture. There's actually been some work on that in CUDA, but uh, it can be done with a lot more generality if you have a more programmable hardware architecture. There is the marching cubes algorithm and a whole lot of other schemes that deserve further exploration there. The other thing is, in addition to new features, you can use the benefits of a more programmable architecture to improve efficiency in rendering. One of the big problems with rendering today is uh, you have this very large high resolution frame buffer, which is even larger when you have multi-sampling. Um, and it turns out the frame buffer bandwidth, your memory bandwidth to the frame buffer is often a limiting factor when you're rendering your scenes. Um, especially with these high, highly multi-pass algorithms that render lots of passes over the screen, read it, uh, read it back, and then write it again. Um, so one of the interesting things you can do is a tiled rendering scheme. There's, there's been some GPU hardware that does this, but it's much more flexible in, in software. Instead of rendering the entire frame at a time, well, if you can render just one little tiny chunk of the frame, say like five by five pixels, um, figure out all of the objects in the scene that affect those five by five pixels and just process them and then go through each little pixel grid on the screen and process them one at a time. If you could do that and do that on a CPU-like device, then you have a small enough frame buffer per that you're operating on, like five by five, that you'll be able to keep all of that data in the CPU cache. So instead of going off to main memory to read your frame buffer and write it in a multi-pass algorithm, now it's right there in cache. You can access it instantaneously, no bandwidth hit, until the very end of this process when you write it out. So instead of reading the frame buffer 20 or 100 times, you just write to it once. And there is an enormous number of other schemes that can be used to optimize rendering performance if you have a software pipeline. And one of the big problems with GPU rendering is there's so much high latency between the CPU issuing rendering commands and the GPU executing them that you can't effectively issue queries, such as asking the GPU, is this object going to be visible? So right now, what we do when we're rendering a scene is we take all of the objects that are approximately pointing, that are approximately in your field of view, and with a few exceptions, we render most of them um, in back to front or whatever order. It would be much more efficient if we could render everything from front to back, and then whenever we got to an object to be rendered, check its bounding box, look at the frame buffer, um, 
and see whether its bounding box is visible. And if it's not visible, then reject it according to the previous data rent that's been rendered so far. So there are some hardware schemes for that. There are uh, predicated occlusion queries that, tell, that let you tell the hardware, oh, figure out whether this thing is visible and render it only if it is. But it's kind of too late at that point. If you've gone to a whole lot of work to generate geometry for that object, then by the time the GPU rejects it, you've already paid the price. And there are hardware visibility queries which enable you to ask the hardware these questions in software. But since you can't get the results back right away, you're usually millions of clock cycles away. They're not very efficient. So moving all of those things to a more general pipeline that's entirely under the programmer's control are interesting. Other areas of improvement, um, improving anti-aliasing through anti analytic techniques as opposed to multi-sample brute force techniques. Uh, translucency is a big problem in current games today because it doesn't interact properly with shadowing and multi-pass algorithms. Other shadowing techniques, large numbers of objects, anywhere you can Im eliminate API overhead. Remember, you have this enormously powerful CPU and enormously powerful GPU and you're talking to them through this single-threaded operating system API that consumes a lot of the performance in the process of mediating. Getting rid of that helps you a great deal. So let me try to boil this down into some potential industry goals for the next generation. Um, I believe we could achieve movie quality anti-aliasing, direct lighting, that is uh, dynamic direct lighting and shadowing on characters, uh, movie quality particle effects, and movie quality reflections in next generation games with commercially feasible hardware. Um, and that's saying a lot. Movies have really set a high standard there. And if you go play Halo or Gears of War and then you look at that side by side with the Blu-ray movie, you notice the games look pretty darn good, but they still have vastly more aliasing and vastly less data per pixel um, than the movies, which use these techniques properly. Um, you know, I believe we could get there. It's within the realm of feasibility in the two to four teraflops range if the programmer has complete control of the pipeline. And in some areas, we just won't be able to get to their ultimate quality. Like, for example, character animation or AI, anything that requires simulating human intelligence uh, requires algorithms that nobody has developed yet. You know, how do you do that? Uh, this is an area that's going to take decades and decades to figure out if we did it at all. But I think we can still achieve significant improvements in those areas. And finally, I wanted to summarize with some lessons learned from the pain of previous hardware transitions and paths we've gone down and turned around from. Um, the first one is that our productivity as programmers, your productivity, is very important. You should defend that with your lives because so many people, especially hardware people and compiler people, will want to offer you a lot more performance at a higher productivity cost. They want you to spend a lot more time to make your code run faster on their hardware. And uh, it's just not commercially feasible most of the time. It, a game development shop writes a huge amount of code in a small amount of time and never has time to optimize it nearly to the level of, that a hardware architect optimizes hardware or a driver architect at a hardware company gets to optimize the driver. So we need to be able to write code quickly and that code needs to be fast and the hardware needs to do whatever is necessary to make that possible. And that's an argument against the sort of trade-offs that were present in Sony's cell architecture where you have eight times more computing power available inexpensively, but it takes a huge amount of effort to extract it. That kind of trade-off is increasingly out of place in, a, you know, in the economics of game development and most consumer software development as well. That means you should also be willing to give up stuff to gain productivity. Be willing to give up performance. Be willing to accept trade-offs in languages, learn new things, and so on. And today's hardware, as I guess we got into this discussion earlier, but there are real serious productivity multipliers as you go into the more convoluted hardware architectures. And we really need to avoid that in the future. Everybody who works on hardware needs to be thinking, most of all, how to enable reasonable software through, uh, through the hardware effort. And finally, we all need to be planning ahead and learning new things because 
there's an enormous lead time for new, new technologies coming onto the market. Yeah, for example, we didn't know we'd be dealing with multi-threaded, multi-core CPUs uh, until just a few years before this generation started. Uh, it takes a huge amount of learning for that. You should always be learning new things, especially in the areas of graphics, programming languages, uh, software de development techniques. Uh, that's really a great investment of time. And that is it. And we have time for some questions. Thanks, Tim.